guest of the week. Hello, Neil. Good, good to be with you, John. How are you, sir? Very well, indeed, thanks. I was reading uh, about you and Stanford University and visiting professor in Beijing, and you got the Benjamin Franklin Prize for public service and a silver medal and the standing long jump or something like that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then right in the middle of all this credit, it says, big fan of punk rock. Absolutely. I, yeah. Uh, raised, raised on the Sex Pistols, the Clash and the Jam. But that dates me. Uh, that tells, tells you I'm a late 1970s teenager. It still makes you younger than me, sir. So, uh, yeah. You know, if, I'll take young any, any day of the week. Younger. There are lots. You know, if you could base it on behavior, I am barely an infant. Well, I, I think that's often said of me by my children. But uh, <laughs> we, 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 we do our best to appear grown up on radio, at least. We have had many guests on the program who have written about social networks. We have gotten the film, The Social Network, also taking a closer look at how Facebook and and Instagram and all of these have changed how we communicate and how we think. But this is really the first book I've seen that kind of looks like that that, that looks at the the predecessors to these things, uh, going all the way back to the. Illuminati and Rome and what were the Mayans doing to communicate with each other? Conceptually, when and how did it come to you to tie all of this together? I suppose moving to Stanford about a year and a half ago, I, I got a shock because I realized that none of the folks who work on Silicon Valley really care about history. Their, their idea of history is that it began around about the Google IPO and everything before that's the Stone Age and not worth studying. So I thought I would write a book that that taught them a history lesson, showing that social networks were not invented uh, at Facebook, and that in fact, uh, we can understand a great deal about the present by looking back and looking at how social networks worked in previous eras. Sure, they didn't have the internet, but you don't need the internet for a large social network. You can do it with the printing press. You can even do it with just the written word. I mean, some of the most extraordinary networks in history, some of the most amazing viral phenomena, think Christianity, spread without any technology. So I think we need to recognize that social networks predate Silicon Valley, and that was a big reason for writing the book. You know, you look at the early Facebook just by watching Game of Thrones, and they had a pigeon. You'd write a exactly. note, and you'd put it on the leg of a pigeon, and how those pigeons always found the intended recipient is still baffling me to this day. We, we can do social networking with any technology that gets the message from A to B. Sure, today's are faster and bigger. No question that, that Facebook is bigger than any previous social network, and certainly things travel faster on the Internet. But I don't think it's as different as people on the West Coast tend to think. There's a general assumption here that they kind of reinvented the world and everything that happened before them is irrelevant. And I think that's absolutely wrong. We, we need to learn some lessons of history if we're to understand what the networked world is going to do next. But, you know, with the, the networks that are available and making the world smaller when it comes to communication, you point out in the book, too, that it certainly comes with a price. You got the dark web, which is a place for the deviants to all get together and make their plans. And it also gives any Tom, Dick or Harry with a computer the right to throw something up on the computer, whether it's true or not. Hence, fake news. Exactly. And although we talk all the time about, about fake news, I'm not sure we think quite deeply enough about why it has become such a problem. And I think the answer is clear. We have these network platforms such as Facebook or Google that essentially rank things, whether in your news feed or in your search results, not according to how true they are, but according to how interesting you find them, how engaging you find them. Uh, you know, Pope endorses Trump was a very engaging headline in 2016. It didn't happen to be true, but it got a lot of eyeballs. Now, as far as the algorithms are concerned, that's all that counts. So we have this problem that our major platforms, the biggest networks in the world, are, are essentially organized with algorithms that prioritize user engagement not surprisingly, because that's how they sell advertising. And user engagement is not a great 
uh, criterion when it comes to truth. So fake news and extreme views, too, are privileged on these giant network platforms. I think that's one reason that our democracy has been hurting lately, because it, it creates a very toxic atmosphere, as you will know. Anybody in the public sphere today, anybody who makes a public statement, uh, will find themselves very quickly on the receiving end of a hail of hostile tweets uh, or Facebook posts. It's not very nice. And, and that's because people online are incentivized uh, to exaggerate, to use extreme language. Did you know, for example, that your tweet is 20% more likely to be retweeted if it contains some emotive or moral language in it? Not to mention the F word, which always seems to go over well on Twitter. So I think this is a real problem that, that is peculiar to the social networks of our time. I think that was much less true when we were networking through printed books and magazines. Now, would that be the F word as a noun or a verb? You, uh, you know, any conceivable shape or form of the F word seems to uh, seems to enhance user <laughs> engagement on Twitter. I find it one of the most depressing features of our life that the, the most unpleasant language is in, in increasingly uh, incentivized by, by social networks. Like, I wish that weren't the case. Like it's not bothersome enough that these things get ranked by popularity as opposed to the validity of a particular story. But you're also getting giant bumps based on Russian bots, which is even more right. terrifying. Well, the Russians were quick to understand the potential of the of the online networks for nefarious uh, purposes, and we were pretty slow in the uptake. So I think one of the reasons that uh, that we're all scratching our heads and wondering, hey, what exactly happened in 2016, is the the revelations that are slowly coming out about just how much on Facebook and on Twitter was generated by the Russians, either by Russians sitting in, in warehouses uh, making up stuff, or by Russian bots doing it on an automated basis. And I think it's very sad that, that Silicon Valley has been so slow to, to fess up. I mean, the initial responses immediately after the election in 2016 were, oh, it's a crazy idea uh, that uh, that fake news on, on Facebook could have played a part in this election. Well, it turns out that as many people saw uh, Russian fake news as, uh, as voted, I mean, it's that bad. I don't think that we can explain the election in terms of Russian intervention. I would go slightly, I would put it slightly differently. I think without Facebook and Twitter, the result would have probably de been different. But it's, it's very clear that the Russians did their best to sow dissension uh, because the messages that they were posting were messages designed to inflame sentiment and to encourage more polarization and, and more extreme views uh, on the part of Americans. Hey, Neil, you talk about the historical context uh, of ways to communicate in networks. Is there a historical equivalent to someone's weird aunt posting fake news on Facebook? Oh, yeah. I mean, the historically equivalent... Uh, is when you, you go back, if, if you want, to the period of when the printing press was the dominant mode of communication. Uh, as the cost of publication went down, as it got cheaper and cheaper to produce pamphlets, all kinds of eccentric people decided to try their hand at, at religious teaching. And there was a proliferation of, of crazy religious sects. I talk about this in, in one part of the book. By the 17th century, there are all kinds of extreme sects proliferating, especially in the English-speaking world, it was very easy to kind of start your own religion, if you like, or start your own Christian sect. Uh, and I think the crazy aunts uh, divided into two groups, those who said uh, that they were in uh, direct contact with God and got themselves a following, and those who were identified as witches uh, by their uh, enemies or their neighbors and got themselves burnt at the stake. So the, the craziness, which is a feature of our time, was also a feature of the period in the 16th and 17th century when the printing press allowed something of a free-for-all in the realm of, of theology and, and religious observance. So maybe we should start burning our crazy ants at the stake. I, I think no burning. I'm, I'm really against it. I think it's, it's, it's by and large never the way to go. Okay. But, but she turned me into a newt. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you're a newt. Put the matches down. Well, Step away from that uh, pile of wood. Well, we did do the nose. Yeah. Got uh, better. <laughs> Neil Ferguson with us. The Square and the Tower are networks and power from the Freemasons to Facebook. And being a historian of some renown, and, and much of your scribings have been about various points and people of history, 
Did you, in your research on this, discover who, what people, or what person might have been the first to even care about mass communication? That's a tricky question. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer it. I mean, Marshall McLuhan famously coined a phrase uh, way back in the 60s, the medium is the message. And that was, a, that was a, an astute observation that as we change the structure of the public sphere, as we move away from newspapers and enter the, enter the online world, things do change. And I think they continue to change. But people have been trying to understand how mass communications produce either the wisdom of crowds or the madness of crowds for well over a century. And uh, I do think that's an important distinction because right now the world divides up between those who think everything is awesome. If we're all connected, the wisdom of crowds will prevail. And those like me who are slightly more skeptical and think that if you connect everybody, you're much more likely to have manias and panics, bubbles and busts. Just think of Bitcoin. Uh, and I think that networked world that we now inhabit is, is, to my mind, quite an unstable, volatile world where things can go viral that are completely nuts just as readily as things that are true, perhaps even more readily. And also in the book, not just speaking at the history, but also looking forward and doing some, some prognostication on your part about when the smoke clears, who, who's going to be the last network standing and and what's not going to be around? I mean, there was a point in time where MySpace was all the rage. Now you can't even find it with a divining rod. Right. I, and, and if you talk to the big uh, tech, tech companies here, they'll say, well, you know, we may be m monopolies at the moment, but we're, you know, competition is just a click away. Someone will come along and disrupt us next. So don't bother with your antitrust. We we'll be gone before you know it. I'm not sure I quite believe that because I think Google certainly has got itself into a pretty unassailable position. Same goes for Amazon. Facebook, I don't think, is going to be dislodged from social networks. So I, I doubt that, uh, that those names are going to vanish anytime uh, soon from, uh, from the landscape. But the names to watch, in my view, are Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, because the Chinese have been busy building their own giant tech companies. And up until quite recently, I just assumed that they would stay in China and the American companies would have the rest of the world. I'm not so sure about that now. Alibaba in particular is a very impressive company that I think could be challenging Amazon certainly in non-U.S. markets in the coming years. And we may get to see a lot more of Jack Ma in the rest of the world, particularly when, when you see the way in which they've jumped ahead in financial technology. And that, that's the kind of thing that interests me. When I look ahead, I think the world is going to be quite divided between American technology companies and Chinese technology companies. And the Chinese ones won't just be in China. And who names their company after something that someone immediately fills in the blank with, and it's 40 thieves. Mm. Yeah, isn't that amazing how things get lost in translation? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I find it extraordinary. And, and yet, uh, I suppose they would say who names his company after a river in, uh, in Brazil that's full of piranha fish. Well, there's always that, too. Uh, Neil Ferguson with us. The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power, from the Freemasons to Facebook. A great read. Uh, great conversation. Oh. A lot of other things out there, too, to get your hands on for Amazon. Neil. I just got it. Amazon. Yeah, it was a river. <laughs> Sorry. I should have given the I should have given the answer. I, or, yeah, I ordered all my Christmas stuff from mm. Nile. Nile dot com. The Nile? <laughs> the, uh, the well known Egyptian river. See see the communication that's lacking in this particular the room. The river here? Yahoo? What? Yeah, that's it. The river <laughs> Yahoo. Thank you. Why don't you lay down and rest a little bit and we'll do news? Hey Neil, thanks so much for the time. Thanks so much, gentlemen. All right, be well. 